Hello and welcome everyone. This is the inaugural Zoom event for the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, we've had online classes for a number of years and used Zoom for many meetings since the beginning of the pandemic, but this is our first online event. So thank you so much for joining us today. This is the first in a series of presentations from faculty from the department in which we're going to be sharing our research and creative work. And we're really thankful that the most senior member of the department volunteered to go first and uh, just try out this technology and see how it goes with all of you. So we really appreciate that. I'm Jill Dorfler, the department head, and I'm going to provide a few logistics and then I'm going to introduce Linda Lagarde Grover, our speaker for today. So um, first of all, we are recording this event. Um, hopefully within a week or so, we will have the recording posted on our website, so it will be accessible there. We have muted your microphones just to ensure that we don't have any interference with the presentation and we don't get any surprise interruptions. You're welcome to ask questions as you think of them at any time by using the chat feature. Um, if you're not too familiar with Zoom, you'll see the chat feature down on the bottom part of your screen and the chat is enabled. So you can feel free to put questions there. And then after Professor Grover is done with the presentation, what I'll do is moderate those questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I might take the liberty of combining questions if we have some that are similar. So we'll work through those towards the end of the presentation. All right, so um, now I'll move into the introduction for Professor Lig Linda Lagarde Grover. Many of you know her as a colleague, a friend, a mentor, a professor. It's great to have uh, so many of you joining us today. She is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Ojibwe with the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe and a longtime resident of Duluth. She has many publications and many awards in teaching as well as research. And in 2019, I'll mention a few. In 2019, she won the College of Liberal Arts Research Award in the Lifetime Achievement category. And I think that she has now joined the ranks of those uh, few Anishinaabe authors that we have that publish so often that some of us feel like we can barely keep up with reading all of the books that come out, uh, which is a great problem, uh, exciting to have. So. I'm going to say a little bit about some of her previous publications. Um, her first collection of short stories, The Dance Boots, was published in 2010 and won a number of prestigious awards, including the Flannery O'Connor Prize. Um, she also published her debut novel, The Road Back to Sweetgrass, in 2016. And that same year, also a book of poetry, The Sky Watched Stories of Ojibwe Lives. Uh, she has also been a longtime colonist for newspapers, different newspapers over the years, and she compiled selected articles in a book, Onagama Singh, Seasons of an Ojibwe Year, which was published in 2017. And then in 2019, another novel, In the Night of Memory, was published. Now here we are in 2020 and Dr. Grover is uh, going to share with us some of her new work that is um, examining the intersections and parallels of traditional Ojibwe stories kind of with our current life for those of us that are here in Duluth in the, the western kind of edge of Lake Superior. The, the new work is going to be a multi-genre work with essays, short stories, and poetry is kind of following the trajectory of her other work working in and across genre in really exciting ways. So um, she's going to share with us some of that new work and we can keep our eyes open for a book from the University of Minnesota Press in fall 2021. So I will turn it over to you, Linda. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Dorfler, and thank you for to everyone for coming here today and and listening to our inaugural um, presentation season here. It'll be um, it'll be interesting to see how how this works. I have a short PowerPoint, and I'll be talking a little bit about some slides here, and um, then I'm going to go more into the the research and what is going to be in the in the book. So first of all, I would like to um, point out where, where it is that I'm, that I'm writing from and writing about. And you can see at the very Western end of Lake Superior, that is where Duluth is. And I, uh, the title of this slideshow has to do with Misabikong, which is another Ojibwe word for Duluth for the region here. There are several different place names for, for many regions. They're not necessarily um, in, in um, old Ojibwe ways, places are not called after a person necessary, necessarily like the city of Duluth. And so one of the words is Anagamasing, the place of the small portage. And the other one that you'll see on my next slide, um, Asabikong means the place of the giants. And I'm writing about, um, I'm writing from the point of rocks. And I, um, I think that's a, a, really, a really good, a good name to use for, um, for what I'm doing here. You can see east of Duluth is um, La Pointe is identified, and that's where Madeline Island is. La Pointe is on Madeline Island. I'm talking, um, um, I'm writing about movement in, in uh, this new work of mine here. And so why I want to show the map and the ceded territories, and the green territory is the the lands that were ceded in the 1854 treaty, and you can see Duluth is right there on the on the edge of that. La Pointe, east of there, uh, I don't know, a couple hours, is um, Madeline Island was where the we we call it the golden age of the Ojibwe during the Great Migration from the east. This was one of the stopping points, and some of um, some of my family then during that migration moved here from La Pointe traveled this way, this is during fur trade days. Some people came down from um, north of Fort Francis and in the Fort Francis area down into the Fond du Lac region here. And some were eventually removed here from the Mille Lacs area, which is in the, oh gosh, I don't know if Mille Lacs is in that yellow treaty area or not. So we have people, you know, lots of times, just as there used to be a kind of a, a, a myth that when America was discovered by European people, it was like this empty place with this handful of Indian people standing on the shore, you know, saying hello. Um, but actually, there were there were a lot of people living here in the interior too, and there was movement going on, just as there has been all over the world. And it's the same. It was the same way here. And so we Ojibwe people have been here for um, I don't know hundreds of years, but we were we were not the original people here, and neither were the Dakota who were here before us. There's been movement for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So we can see, I'm writing mostly about Duluth, the Duluth area here, and then southwest of here, just a little bit to the original Fond du Lac settlement, uh, before the reservation and before the 1854 treaty and the movements, and then up the shore there, all the way up to Canada, where the Grand Portage Reservation was established and where some of my relatives um, still live today. So here's here's a picture of part of the Point of Rocks in the middle of Duluth. And I was when I was talking about this research with uh, my colleague Dr. Bauer Kemper, I said, "Well, I'm 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 using the point of rocks as kind of a a place to look from when when um, when writing and researching." And I said, "Do you know where Point of Rocks is?" He said, "Well, yeah, it divides Duluth in half." And he's right. You um, there are some roads that go around Point of Rocks and above Point of Rocks, which extends for like really, I think for like three miles, but there are roads that cross Duluth over and around it. But at the bottom, at the base here, it um, there really is only, has only been um, 
movement and travel there on lakes on um, Superior Street at the bottom and uh, Michigan Street below that and now the now the freeway that was put in. So it's kind of, it's a massive thing. And a long time ago, uh, in the last 150 years, 100 years, there was an attempt, there were attempts to blast it out in order to make um, East and West more accessible. And that never worked. It was, it was too big, too massive, too hard to do. So this is just one little piece. It's called Gabbro Rock. It's, um, it's really, really old rock. Here's an old picture of the Point of Rocks uh, on a postcard. I kind of like this one because it's got a streetcar. And you can see there's a little, a little fen fence and stairs going up. People lived up there and lived even in back of this part of the Point of Rocks. And in that, in that blasted out space is where um, immigrants from Italy settled when they came to Duluth. And so that place is called Glen Place. Well, I'll show you. And Little Italy, the Glen, the Hollow. And this is a postcard from a long time ago where we can see that there were houses nestled, really kind of packed into this little hollow here. And the Point of Rocks comes right over the top. It was interesting to me when I um, opened the Duluth News Tribune today to see that there's a picture of this same place here, but um, with some of the Duluth Police Department there, um, are going to be, um, well, I guess, clearing out a homeless encampment there for the winter because it's, uh, it's dangerous, it's cold, people die of exposure. But I, I thought it was very interesting when I looked there that that same, same overhang was right there. There's a more, you know, kind of a recent picture. You can see a car and it's uh, blasted out a little bit, but not a whole lot. Looking east from the Point of Rocks, standing up there, and I've and I've stood on places on the Point of Rocks many, many times over the years. I was born here in Duluth. So if we look east, kind of northeast, we can see here's part of Duluth and the bridge. And to the left, you keep going up the North Shore, and it's it's beautiful drive, and you get all the way up to uh, well to Canada and beyond. Looking westward. This is an old picture that I like, a postcard. We, we call it the West End. So it's the view from the, from the top of, well, from up on the point of rocks there. And uh, West, West End is the area immediately to the west of the point of rocks. So we have downtown immediately to the east and West End immediately to the west. And that's where Duluth used to, used to end. That was called the West End. And since then it expanded out further. So it's confusing to people who aren't from here. They wonder where the West End is because there's a whole lot out further west. But this is the West End. Today, West End. And I have this picture here. It is a view from a sidewalk in the West End. And this is really, I think, where, um, where something on my research really, it was, a, it was a, like a little turning point. The West End is, um, has been, it's never been a really prosperous area, but it has its own little downtown. And over the years, times have been good, times have been not so good. Um, and in, I don't know, the last 10 years or so, there've been some businesses that have moved in there and uh, there's been a, um, there's like a craft district there. So there you make people, there are people with craft beers and, and arts and crafts and gift shops and a number of little restaurants. And I went into, um, I went into a sandwich shop there last year sometime. And, you know, looking at the view um, at that, at that little sandwich shop, you know, we were just, I don't know, maybe within a block of many places that my relatives have lived and within um, within a block of where my great great grandmother eventually lived and, and died in her um, as a very old person in her in her grand granddaughter's house. And so from that view, you know, I just went into the sandwich shop and there was a colleague from UMD. She had come there to the West End with her kids to try out the sandwiches. And so we we exchanged some pleasantries and stuff. And she said, it's so beautiful here with that bluff, isn't it? And I thought, a bluff? I didn't know we had a bluff. So I looked out the window and sure enough, there it was, the western side of the Point of Rocks, which is um, part of the West End that we call Goat Hill. 
I think because why they call it Goat Hill, probably because only goats could really navigate this place. It's very, very steep. There are some little streets in there and you can see there are you know, some houses on the way up there. And I thought to myself, you know, it really is beautiful here. And to have someone who is not originally from the area come out here and comment on how beautiful it is with that bluff. I thought, oh, you know, she's right. Now, when you go way out west in Duluth, you get to the city limits, which is called, it's called the Fond du Lac neighborhood. And that is where there was a settlement of native people, of Ojibwe people, that was very close right across the, the St. Louis River winds through this picture. It goes for, you can see for miles and miles. And um, on the St. Louis River was a, um, a fur trade post. And there was a, a large community of native people there. When that, when the 1850, the fur post was not doing, wasn't prospering anymore after like 1840s anyway. And with the 1854 treaty, then when lands were ceded and reservation boundaries were established, the people who lived in this area then were moved to what is now the Fond du Lac Reservation. And I guess that's where I, that's where I'm going to start with some of my things here. Um, I have a picture here of a, a piece by Bruce King, who is an Oneida artist. And this is a picture of Sky Woman who fell to the earth long time ago. The stories start a long time ago. She fell to the earth and that is where, um, that's where human, human life began on, on earth here. Ours is um, a matriarchal, tribe, a matriarchal society. It, that doesn't mean the same as matrilineal, but it does, it does have to do with, um, with the position of women in that society. And there is a, there is a great honoring of, of womanhood in Ojibwe ways. It's, um, it has to do with um, this woman who became the grandmother of our, our Nanabuju, our spirit hero. And women are um, of the gender that you know carries life and brings it into the world. Whether a, whether a woman actually gives birth to a child or not has nothing to do with the great honor that women have being you know being women. So it starts with this. And I've thought to myself, as I was starting to just look through some things with Duluth and with an old story that I heard a long time ago, that these old stories have a purpose that I hadn't really given a great deal of thought of to until recently. You know, we think of the old time Ojibwe stories as they establish a, you know, a history and, you know, there are our spiritual um, guide. They are, um, they tell us how to act, they amuse us. But it occurred to me a while ago that we actually are reliving these stories and that we always have been. And that the stories themselves are not static and sitting in the time in which they took place, but they are, they are with us. I don't even wanna say repeating. I think it's a spiral, a spiral, uh, a concept that is with us all the time that we aren't, aren't aware of just as um, the people who were in the old stories weren't aware that this is going to be, this is going to become the, the guide for what happens in, in the world in the future. So I start with Sky Woman. Oh, I hope you can see this. Um, and this one is um, by Ojibwe artist Rabbit Strickland and it's called Nanabuju and Brother Wolf. Our spirit hero was a, was a twin and had a, a younger brother who was uh, Mayingan the wolf. And they walked the, as Nanabuju walked the earth and the earth became what it is, how we see it today. His brother was with him much of the time, but his brother, um, his brother was lost to him in, um, in a series of tragedies. And those are things that we can learn from also. And, you know, about um, keeping good feelings in the world and, you know, not being vengeful people. And I'll kind of get into that a little bit. And the guy on the left here is my grandpa. 
and he's there with a couple of our other relatives. And I like this picture because even though they are on the top of a roof that they've been working on, they could very well be on, on, um, on the point of rocks, looking down and watching, watching as things happen, just taking it all in. And so here, I think this might be my last slide. Yeah, if you can all see, see all these. This is, um, these are pictures of some of the women in, in my family. The woman at the far right on the top slide was one of the people who was removed from Mille Lacs and went up to the, Grand, um, to the Fond du Lac area. The woman on the far left is her grand, is her uh, daughter-in-law, my, my great grandma, my grandpa's mother. And if you can see the lower pictures, hope you can. Um, <clears throat> On the lower, in the lower pictures, you can see that um, the woman at the far left is my great great grandmother, who was born in the Fond du Lac neighborhood out there in 1839. She was the um, she was the daughter of a of a young couple who had moved there from La Pointe and went to work probably to work there, having to do with the fur trade, and so from there, as it is with. I think probably just about every native family up here, the families had children, the children married, had children with other, you know, other people um, from other, other areas. My, um, my grandmother married, or my great grandmother married a man from um, Nut Lake and moved up, lived up there. And so we became part of the, of the Boys Fort Band. And I'm just going to put that back to my grandfather a little bit and let let him kind of look at this and I'll get off the screen here and talk a little bit about my research here. So let's see if I can make this work. So see you later. All right, and now now we're all now we're all on the screen here. <clears throat> So my research here is being presented in four parts. And the first part is I, I titled it Point of Rocks because I'm using that as the as kind of the, the point, the place from, from where we're looking. We're looking north, north and east, we're looking south and west. And we are looking um, at a place that there are many, many, many lives have been lived. We are, you know, layers and layers of lives and experiences and stories over a very, very long time. And so with the sense of place and this sense of history, when I look out from Point of Rocks, you know, I, I can see a lot of stuff that man has made. And then I, I realize that people like my own relatives were, you know, walking on those, walking on those streets before they were streets and, and living there too. And that their own stories then were really, um, they, were, uh, they were part of the fabric of, of what is, you know, this, this place of the giants here. And so they, you know, they are certainly giants too. They may, they may not have been people who have been, you know, written down in history, for you know things things that they did they were um, they were sometimes um, I guess almost like roadkill in west western expansion but that doesn't mean that their existence and what it meant means to this place to have Ojibwe people having lived here and be here still it doesn't it doesn't negate anything there there are people who and I do write about this there are um, Often people wonder, you know, are there are there sacred places in Duluth in this region here, and are there things that are sacred to Native people? And yes, uh, this, you know, absolutely there are. And at some point, um, somebody was wondering, should there be signs put up designating this? And I thought, well, I. I don't really want to be part of something like that. So I didn't actually identify any spots, though they are there and we walk on them sometimes. And there are there might be buildings, there might be stores and shops, there might be sidewalk and parking lot on them. But that doesn't mean anything in the long run. We come and go, our civilization comes and goes. And we are not powerful enough as human beings to, um, we don't have the power to negate that, the sacredness of those places. We are, we are, we are not significant enough for that, for that. So I'm looking, I'm looking at um, 
<clears throat> I'm, I'm calling some of these places even holy places, and I don't name them here. In back of Duluth, up the hill from Duluth, is a really big ridge of rock that runs from, um, oh, south of where Fond du Lac Reservation is today, runs all the way up the lake shore, away from the shore a little most of the time, and up into Canada. That whole thing is significant spiritually to us. As is, as is the point of rocks. So how do you designate one particular space? You, um, you actually, I, I don't think you actually can. And so with that, within that great ridge then, that, can, that has been here for a very, very long time. And there used to be a glacier here and it melted away. So the, you know, Duluth here, you know, we're really in kind of a little valley here from when that glacier melted away. So Duluth isn't all that isn't all that old. We're, you know, I, I think that, um, I think it's like 10,000 years I'm trying to, trying to think of that. So there are some stories having to do with what is now the city of Duluth itself and the terrain here that may not be part of the old time Ojibwe sacred stories, but at the same time they intersect with them. And I'm not really going to go into them right now, but they have to do, well, mostly I won't. They have to do with beings here, with human beings and with spirit beings, um, you know, on the, on the lake and, and into the interior here. And some of those very old stories do actually intersect and co coincide with things that, that have gone on in contemporary times. And that's um, so. I um, that's one thing I'm I'm writing about and wondering, you know, wondering wondering the reason for this, and and then understanding that it isn't important for us to understand the reason, but to just understand that's that's what it is. Um, here's how things were. Here's how they are now, and that we're um, we're the indigenous people are are here. So a funny thing is when I was talking about the blasting out in the point of rocks there, and it never really succeeded. So they had to just kind of let it sit there. Um, there was an idea that there might be gold here, like, you know, a long time ago. And so that was the reason for the blasting. And I don't think they ever found gold, but they did create quite a hollow there, kind of in the center of the point of rocks. And when the Italian immigrants came to this area, and this would have been, I don't know, nine, early 1900s, they ended up, a lot of them ended up settling in that little hollow there. And so that's why some people call it the hollow and why, um, why uh, it came to be called Little Italy. That community is no longer there, um, and I think that all the houses are gone. But when I was a when I was a young woman, there were still houses there. And one of my sisters married a guy who lived in lived in the the glen. They call it the glen. Lived in the glen, and I had um, one of my one of my girlfriend's grandma lived there. And so um, so it was kind of a I don't know, kind of a, a rustic looking place in in the middle of city there. The Italian people, they were, a, Duluth used to be a really um, ethnic type of place. So there were, you know, the Italians were one community. They settled kind of in the, in the glen there, in the hollow, moved up the hill. And so, um, so there are still people with Italian names living along the whole hillside there, all the way up into the, um, the top of the hill there. My family, my, um, my mother's family ended up um, intermarrying with an Italian family here as um, kind of a step family. So I'm not Italian myself, but I um, but once in a while I've I've written how I have I have some really I have some lovely child uh, Italian childhood memories. And that has to do with being being with a community that was like a um, there were people in this community here were still first and second generation Italian people when I was a girl. And so I was raised among Italians. And I, I grew to have a great, great love of that, of that culture and the people there. And they seem to really um, love the children in my family. I think 
they thought that we might have looked like Italians to them a little bit. So we kind of we kind of clicked. We we kind of communicated in that way. So I write a um, a little bit about that particular immigrant family. Uh, you know, large group of people in Duluth here, and that um, the interactions with native people here. And Duluth is kind of like a small town. And so many people are related, if not by blood, by some type of relationship to other people here when your family's been here a long time. And that's how my, my family is with, um, with some of the large extended Italian families here. And so I write a little bit about that experience and, and our own and, it's, um, and, and also about one, just one little thing that happened is I, um, I went to a um, to a funeral for one of the one of the old aunties, one of the old Italian aunties, and we um, some of us were sitting in the very front row there next to her family, and I was sitting next to one of the cousins, the Italian cousins, not by blood, and he said, "Oh, it's you know, it's so nice to see all you guys here," and and I said, "Yeah," I said, "You know, we almost look like Italians, don't we?" And you could see that he's like, well, no, you don't. But he was very, very polite and nice about that. And, you know, it was, I just thought it was kind of funny because, you know, when it came right down to it, um, actually, we, we weren't. But he thought it was really nice that we came there. So from, from writing about establishing the stance of place, the next thing I want to write about is the walking of Ojibwe people on the, on the land here. And I write about quite a bit about what was the, I guess you'd call it the Bowery area of Duluth, which is just east of the Point of Rocks. And, you know, you saw that picture of my grandfather surveying the area. He, um, he spent a lot of time in that area. He did a lot of things. And the Bowery area, that particular part of it, one end of it um, was the, the Bethel Mission Society. And at the other end, about, I don't know, 10, blo 10 blocks further, East was the um, Union Gospel Mission. And so along First Street and Fourth Street in Duluth, there were a lot of, and there still are, a lot of Native people living there. And there are people who live there who have some really difficult times in their lives. And my grandfather was one of those people. And he actually, he died um, in an alley just below First Street um, when I was, um, when I was um, 19. And he, you know, he was found there and he had, nobody knew if he had fallen or if something had happened to him, if somebody had taken his money or whatever, but he died, he had pneumonia and died really quickly right after that. And I thought about that, you know, a man who I thought was, you know, I know that this is very, he was an intelligent man. He knew he had, he had spent much of his life learning, you know, and becoming educated in the ways of of Ojibwe people and he he could dance and he knew the songs and he um, he he knew many many things but he'd had a really hard hard existence here during these times of movement and times of land loss and times of removal of people from one reservation to another um, some of us eventually ended up at White Earth um, there was there was great um, there was great upheaval in people's lives and and I um, and I guess my grandfather and many people like him are just kind of an illustration of that. Is his a tragic existence? You know, I I don't think so. And I and I write about how Nanabuja walked the earth here, and still today there are native people who walk the earth, and they may be walking around in the West End or in you know in the First Street district of downtown. They're walking back and forth, but they're walking in the same way. And in the same, all we know, even though they're on sidewalk, in the same path and footpath of um, of our hero Nana Buju. And so I bring some thought about some of the old time stories and what exactly this this might possibly mean to us today. And I write about the the spirits of the lake, and I write about some of the spirits of of the woods, and some of these. Spirits are, are ones where I, I got a little close to things that we, you know, I haven't usually gotten that close to. And one of them is with the, the Mishibajig, the lake spirits, who are out there in the bottom of the lake and nobody's ever seen them except for in one story I know one, one woman did a long time ago. 
and that they're out there in the lake and that is, that is their home. And we can sometimes see little traces of them if we look out in the water and often we can't. And when I think about things like, you know, the impact of people on, on land and water and stuff and really our insignificance as human beings. I, you know, we, we get some really big storms on Lake Superior and there's talk about, you know, our lake walk, that's a man-made thing. So people can just walk along the side of the lake and look at it. And I've always wondered if that is really an appropriate thing to be doing. Um, you know, it's, um, we're, we're making our, our little boardwalk and then it isn't working because it's washing away. And so now, now we're doing concrete and, as um, I was on Facebook looking at people commenting on this and one, one woman said, the lake all, always wins and it always will. And I write a little bit about the spirits out in the woods too and what we're doing out in the woods and are we, are we really, when we, when we try to tame the woods into things where we might just kind of walk in almost like tourists in our, our little camping situations and stuff, is that, are we, are we necessarily, when we're altering anything, um, acting in an appropriate way with, with the woods and the, the homes of the, the animals and the spirits who live there? And I've pondered that a little bit in this. I can't, I can't give you an answer. I'm not, you know, I'm not the person who knows everything. So I write about the spirits, then I write a little bit more about Nanabuju and about his brother Wolf and about um, Nanabuju being a, a, he was, when he was born, he was a, a small white rabbit. And I, I write about rabbits in Ojibwe people and the wolf in Ojibwe people. And then I start bringing in some fictional work, which is, um, I have a couple of short stories that have to do with if, um, once I've introduced the old stories, and the old identifications of relationships, then introducing a fiction story, which is really a fictionalized story. I write fiction, but it's, but it's true. And so what I have been doing is paralleling those, those stories. And, and that is where I began to see uh, not a repetition, but a, almost like a, a melding, a melding of experiences. And so that's where I, that's where I've gone with that. And then in the last part of this, I return to um, my grandfather and that story and what it means, what it means to be an, o an Ojibwe man who lived, lived his life here and affected many, many people with his life and is, and is now gone. His time, his time here was done. And during the, during the, um, writings that I did for this, there were, there were a couple of experiences that I thought were a little unusual that happened. I got an email one day from a woman who had seen one of my books and wondered if I was related to Elias Lagarde, my grandfather, because she had she was, you know, somebody my age, and she had known him when she was a girl, when she was a young woman. And so she wanted to tell me about her experiences with him. Her father was a, a policeman, a law enforcement man who knew my, knew my grandfather through many interactions in that way and having to do with the incarcerations and the, the county work farm and things like that. And that, that she had, um, her dad develops a sort of a friendship with my grandfather within the boundaries of who they who they were you know society does have those boundaries for us and that within that she she was touched by this and became somebody who listened very carefully to what he had to say and to watch what he had to do and she wanted me she wanted me to know somewhat something of what her own experience and her family's experience had been with him and we actually got together and had a really long conversation just before the pandemic. And so we haven't gotten together that since, but it, I don't wanna say that this is a closing of a circle. I don't think anything ever actually closes, but it was something that brought, brought a couple of pieces of something together. And we both then had a realization of, um, you know, the, the, um, the many things he knew about the about the um, living in the outdoors and the seasons and hunting and fishing and how to interact with the with the world around him that he taught to her has continued to affect her today and she still lives out 
out in the in the woods. And who knows, maybe that's why I live in town here. My interactions with with him were um, were always here in, in in an urban setting here. And so I bring I bring all these things into this piece here. And there, you know, there's fiction and poetry and um, little bits of essays. They're all written in uh, pretty short pieces and then um, gathered into those four sections. And it does create, um, it's not a portrait of a person. It's not a portrait of, um, of me, but I do think it's a, it's a portrait of a place. And that would be, you know, Misabi Kong here, the, the place of the giants here at the Western end of, um, of Lake Superior. So um, Misa, yeah, with that, I, I think I'm, um, if anybody has any questions or comments, you know, I'll, you know, do my best with them. Maybe watch for listening to me. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Linda. It's just wonderful to learn more about this new work and to see some of those historic photos and the postcards and the areas of town that many of us are familiar with. Um, I'm going to invite everyone to start typing questions into the chat. I know some people have joined um, after we got started, so I'll just repeat a few of my little logistics as we transition here into questions. So just as an FYI, we are recording this presentation and it will be linked on our website in a week or two. This is our inaugural event on Zoom, doing a department thing on Zoom. So we anticipate uh, in relatively short order, we'll get that done. Everyone is currently muted and I invite you to use the chat feature in order to ask your questions. Many of you have used Zoom before, but if you haven't, you can see the chat bubble on the bottom of the Zoom screen. And once you click on it, the chat will open. And we already have uh, a question coming in from Jennifer Brady. I'll share that and then I'll invite others to, as you're thinking of questions, pop them in there and I will um, moderate, so to speak. So, um, Question just a little bit more, Linda, if you can talk about the place of giants and speak about that name a little bit. It's an Ojibwe name. And I, I, as far as I know, it refers to that very large Gabbro Ridge. And then um, with the outcropping that comes down all the way down to, I mean, it used to be all the way to Lake Superior, that it's such a, it's such a large thing. I know that when we look, you know, if you, if you go, you know, Googling and looking at pictures of large rock formations, there are many that are bigger and stuff like that. But here, the significance of something that is, that is so large and so, um, and it's so long. I mean, if you, um, you know, um, you, you may have heard stories of some, some places call it the sleeping giant that whole ridge there and some of our old stories about Nana Buju and there are many and they vary some from region to region but there are some that that say that you know both literally and figuratively he is um when his work ended here for a while some people say that he is sleeping and so some people will say that is a sleeping giant. And I've, I've seen that in other parts of the country, there are areas that are called that. And I've wondered if that might come from their indigenous ways of, um, of looking at the world also. And so that's, that's where, you know, the place of the giants, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, powerful word. And, you know, I, as, as we ponder it, we can think about the many, many things that it might mean. And I think it might mean not just one thing. And you know, rock in you know, Ojibwe worldview in languages is is, um, is an animate, living type of thing. And so, um, you know, what what does that mean with this too? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's so important the the concept in Anishinaabe and Ojibwe culture is that there are always many meanings and there isn't a singular kind of correct answer. Sometimes we're looking for that in Western society, we're looking for the exact right, but as you said, there are many stories, different interpretations and different ideas across and, and all of those are good. 
and interesting to, to learn about. Um, we have a question about um, the, the ideas of time and stories moving in a spiral. And I'll pick that one up because I, it's something that moved through your presentation. And sometimes we think of Anishinaabe stories in a cycle or in a seasonal way. And so I'll, I'll add that into the question about thinking. Um, the, the question here is from Karen who says, lately I keep hearing people say this time is unprecedented but I'm not sure that I believe that. Can you say more about the echoes of the past in our present? I've, I've thought, you know, when we look at the, you know, Ojibwe people around, you know, this part of the country here have lived in a, a, a cycle of seasons, you know, um, according to really food sources and what's, what's available in the, in, the, in the natural world around, around them. And so when we think of, the seasonal cycle we we usually start with spring and you know and then we stop at winter but actually what you know after winter comes spring <laughs> there's a poem about that um <clears throat> and so i don't i don't think you know the seasons do not close in that circle they continue and so i've i've started to think of of time passing as a as a having a spiral effect in that way. Are these unprecedented times? I think all times are unprecedented times. I mean, I was a I was in my late teens in the year 1968, and that spring was an unprecedented time also. Doesn't mean that this isn't serious stuff, but it it does mean that there and and I don't even, I don't want to say, oh, things pass, because that isn't what I mean either, because even as things pass, they remain with us all the time. And I think that is one of the one of the points that I'm trying to make with, with what I'm writing too, that it's always with us, we are part of it. And we have, I think, an obligation as, as human beings to, to remember that and to always, always, always keep that in mind as we live our lives. I mean, walking around in Duluth here, for all, for all, for all you know, you're walking on a very sacred spot when you step, absolutely. And so I think keeping that in mind, a sacred spot as far as, as far as, um, as far as the the very very old stories of Nanabuju and Nolkomas, his his grandma, that, but also as those stories have have spiraled into the the time we live now. I mean, certainly the you know. Um, my uncles used to call them the the Nijis, the um, um, the friends, the Indian guys who, you know, mostly guys walking around downtown and walking around the West End, wandering around, and then at night they would they would go in to wherever they sleep. Where might that have been? Um, and he would say the the Nijis, and he meant that they're friends, and he meant that they are also they are also us too. I mean, we're you know we're we're all part of the the same people and. And so they're they're part of this story too, as as we are. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question here that's about how uh, Ojibwe band affiliation works or tribal affiliation works. And you talked a little bit about relatives from different areas and where they moved. And the question here is, if there's a sort of custom between about how people's identity might connect to their band and how those customs are followed today which of course is a legal process today that uh, now that we're into the 20th century but just uh, maybe a brief bit about movement and bands and then affiliation i think that you know in the past people identified um, their identity was tied into their into their extended family and their clan and where they were living. As European expansion came into this area, and you know it was mainly through the fur trade, and then of course missionaries and settlement, all these things created um, a squeeze 
on the people here then who had to relocate. And so uh, my family who relocated here from, from Madeline Island were here probably for economic reasons and for opportunity. Oh yeah, there's a fur post out there and you know, we can, you know, the food is getting scarce here. We're having a rough time, we'll move out there. And so once the, um, once the treaties were signed and I, I speak mo mostly about the 1854 treaty, which established reservations in, in Northeastern Minnesota. Then as people were relocated onto reservation lands, they later on then, those reservation lands were divided into separate um, parcels that were allotted to families or to individuals, land allotments. And so with that, people then legal, had sort of a legal status, I guess, as land owners. And once you have that concept of that land ownership and also being being on um, being recorded as being a member of a group of people who are on this reservation. I mean, nobody, I can't think of anybody who might have wanted to have move and go on to a, res a small, smaller area of land, a reservation. But once we had those, and once we had records of people who were associated with particular parcels of land, then we began to really associate ourselves with that particular reservation with that band. And so my, um, my grandmother and her family um, had moved up to um, Lake Vermilion because that's where her husband and all his family were. And so they, they established an extended family up there. And when it became time to establish the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, and before that they were part of, they were listed as um, under the um, control of the, uh, was it called the consolidated? <sighs> I can't remember. Anyway, um, then you've then you've got an actual lineage that's tied to a legal identity that is tied to the land, and so when I think we are, I think we have a relationship with the land in many many ways, and you know there's certainly cultural and spiritual, but there's also this connection then that results in our identity as native people. So that's kind of a it's kind of a um, it's a big topic these days. Um, now the, des the descendants of people who were allotted parcels of land who became the base roles of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. Um, we uh, legal blood quantum requirements for membership got thrown in there. Um, these weren't things we especially wanted either, but now we really are dealing with, with that. And so we there are people who are certainly, you know, descendants of the original Alatis or descendants of people who are official members of tribes. I am an official member of a tribe with a number. I mean, whoever thought that we would have wanted a number to be numbered as Indians, but it is it is one of the ways we identify ourselves as native people now, but not the only one and it certainly should not be the only one. At the same time, I believe that it is our, our birthright as native people. Excellent. Good. It's a, the the that question. It's a very complex. Uh, we could probably have a whole several sessions on those topics. But let's circle back to your work and how this uh, question from our friend overseas in Switzerland, Patricia. Lovely to have you with us today. She's wondering if you can say a little bit about how this project started and how it kind of fits in with your continuum of work, because you have several interrelated, many of your, your short stories and then your novels have been in a series and there's interrelationships woven through them all. Can you say a little bit about this current work and how it fits, um, how it got started and then how it fits in with your work more broadly? I had a, a couple of short stories that I hadn't really done anything but had been saving for a while and i i looked at those and i and i thought is this something that could be the beginning of another novel or is it something that i really want to connect with other other stuff that i've been working on and and really researching and actually living i mean all my life and that's when i decided to do that and i thought you know at at my at my age at this point in life, what I what I want to have is, um, and I 
I have a body of work now. I want to establish um, just my, through, through my own eyes, through my own writing, this is how it has been and this is how it is now. And that there is not, there should not be a line of separation here. That's what I what I wanted to do with this. And so I've enjoyed everything I've done actually. I enjoy writing the poetry, had a great time with the with the fiction. And now I um, because I felt that my my grandfather and you know his mom and the women women in the family who um, who carried carried us all here, I felt that I really wanted to to honor them in this way too, not because I am the person of you know able to bestow honor on them, but to acknowledge to acknowledge that. And mine is mine is only one of many, many, many stories of of native people. But I thought I would do this and from here, you know, other native people I I hope will um will see this and and um and it'll it'll um it'll kind of connect with their own stories too. Where our stories are all different, you know, that's for sure. But yet we have a, a basic foundation. I mean, we're, we're really so fortunate to have that. Um, we've been, you know, we've been lucky to survive. We've been lucky because of people who went before us that made it possible for us to be here. Their sacrifices were you know, very, very large. And, um, and I think we should um, acknowledge that and know what we can. Beautiful. I think that we are technically two minutes to go, but I think that's a, it's a really beautiful ending point. We have many uh, thank yous coming in through the chat and we appreciate that. And we appreciate you sharing this new work with us and some of these ideas that connect us to, to place here and this continuum and spiraling of time and experiences that are melding together. And I think helping people understand that we're a part of that. Like you said earlier, you know, there isn't this line, this is a, a spiral and a continuum. So I really appreciate that. So okay. with that, if, if you have something else, otherwise, no, I would just like to say miigwech everybody. I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate Dr. Dorfler and, and the other people I work with here who we managed to pull this together, our very first one. <laughs> so, thank you, giga wobble men. <laughs> exactly, giga wobble men. Thank you everyone. <laughs> this went off uh, very smoothly. So we look forward to seeing you at our next one. Until that time, enjoy your evening. Thank you so much.